I'd like to introduce you to the Darkness Necromancer. Now, the particular flavor of Darkness Necro that we're looking at right now is the Sever Necromancer that's also using Skeleton Mages. There's going to be a lot of different versions of the Shadow or Darkness Necromancer, and the reason why I like this one in particular, it continues to be able to take advantage of stats like Critical Strike, Critical Strike Damage, as well as Vulnerable and Vulnerable Damage. It has a ton of customization as far as aspects and skills are concerned, and it uses, quite frankly, the coolest looking skill in the game, which is, of course, Sever, an ability that spawns a Grim Reaper scythe-wielding madman to dash forward, attacking, dealing damage as it travels, and then as it travels back to you, dealing even more damage, and then attacking another time, meaning that Sever can hit a target four times, and it's also one of the builds that I would actually recommend using the player character outline, considering this build gets a little bit dark. Now I'm going to have timestamps down to everything below in case you want to jump around, but we are going to cover everything in this video. Early game gear, late game gear, aspects you should look out for, early game paragon board, the skill tree itself, the reason why I built it the way that I did, an in-depth mechanical understanding of how all the skills and abilities work together. So if that's something that you were looking for, you've come to the right place. In my other video, I actually started off with all the mechanical stuff up front, and I know that that might not necessarily keep everybody's attention. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to be running Annika's Claim on World Tier 2. This is one of the most famous dungeons in the game at this point, and I just wanted to show you on base, with nothing else really going for it, what the build can do. I do not have a single aspect currently available. It's only a level 46 character, so I don't have any Paragon points. I'm just using the base skill tree in the Book of the Dead to see what the build can do. So the idea of the build is pretty simple, generating a corpse, using corpse tendrils to get everybody into the same area, and then dumping Sever into the middle of everything so that it can hit as many targets as possible as it does those four different damage instances. And as you notice, we're also using the Miasma Corpse Explosion. So this is going to drop a damage over time ability that makes it quite difficult to see our character. That's why I recommend the character outline because you quite literally will not be able to see if you have more than three or four of these on the ground at any given time. So the big additional damage from that corpse explosion helps us to keep single target damage up high while we're either getting back our resource or using reap to set up the next corpse tendrils pull. Even here on an elite, we walk forward, make sure that our skeletons get into the combat as well, get the guy stuck onto one of our corpses, drop corpse explosion, and then dump in with sever as often as we can. And then reap will help us to generate more corpses in case we haven't managed to do so from any other sources. And as you can see, even with nothing else on it but underleveled gear for where we are right now, it does pretty okay. It actually does surprisingly well considering a lot of necromancer abilities without any aspects or skills isn't really that great. Now that you have a base understanding of what the build is supposed to do, let's go into a deep mechanical dive for the skills themselves, then we'll look at the skill tree, and then we'll go ahead and look at some of the aspects that are absolutely key and crucial for this build that are all available within the Codex of Power, so they are super easy to unlock. And then we'll run more of this dungeon with those aspects on our gear, and you can see just how much more powerful it becomes with those simple additions. Our generator skill is Reap, and quite frankly, Reap is not a great generator skill itself. It can hit multiple targets, meaning that if there are five, six targets within in range, you're generating 20, 24 essence every single time that you swing. But why we're actually using this is because it auto generates a corpse on any target that it hits once every five seconds. So we're able to engage a fight with Reap, immediately drop a corpse tendrils, and then either start corpse exploding or severing depending on what the monsters look like. It also happens to be a darkness skill, so it's going to benefit from all of our passives in the skill tree that say darkness, and also give us a cheap tool to be able to generate movement speed at ease. The direct damage portion of this build comes from the skill sever itself. So I've already talked about the fact that it deals damage where it lands, when it lands back on you, and when it travels both times. One of the best parts about sever is that it's also an opportunity to be able to apply vulnerable. For the necromancer, being able to apply vulnerable is typically reserved for the bone skills and very specifically for corpse tendrils if you use one of its enhancements. Sever being able to apply vulnerable as well means that after that corpse tendrils comes down and that vulnerability runs out, you can continue to stack it with sever, and as long as you have good enough resource management, you can basically keep up vulnerability 100% of the time. 
We're using the Miasma Cloud version of Corpse Explosion, meaning that it's going to drop a damage over time area around the corpse that it explodes on. It does a ton more weapon damage than the base Corpse Explosion would, but it can't critically strike or overpower, so that's why the base damage of it is so much higher. It also deals this damage over 6 seconds, and it ticks twice per second, so a single Corpse Explosion will deal its damage over a total of 12 ticks. Now the best part about it is that casting multiple Corpse Explosions all count as their own skills, their own ticks, so that's for the purposes of Lucky Hit and any additional procs that we'll get later on in the skill tree and in our key passive. So if we were to drop 5 Corpse Explosions on top of a monster, that means that every second they would be taking 10 ticks of shadow damage, each one having an opportunity to again trigger Lucky Hit and any other passives that we might have. Corpse Tendrils is just the bread and butter of every single Necromancer build. It applies slow, stun, and vulnerable to all monsters that are affected by it. We are using raised skeletons, we're using raised skeletal mages. Skeletal mages actually deal shadow damage on their attacks, and we're currently using the shadow mages which are able to apply a secondary missile every 5 attacks. So basically every 5 attacks, it's like they actually attacked 6 times. The other great part about the Shadow Mages is that they typically stay out of range of monsters as often as they can, so it's not as hard to keep them alive as some of your other minions would be. We're also sacrificing our Skeleton Skirmishers and our Golem, but we'll cover that in the Book of the Dead portion of the video later. And then lastly, every Necromancer needs to have Blood Mist on their skill bar because you need an Oh No button when you get trapped in crowd control. This is incredibly important, especially as you move into the later game, into World Tier 3 and World Tier 4, and try to start clearing out Nightmare Dungeon content. Basically, everything is applying crowd control to you at all times. It actually gets really heinous if you have enough affixes and really dirty types of monster family groups together in a single dungeon, so I cannot stress enough just how important Blood Mist is. A lot of people have been theorycrafting and trying to not run Blood Mist on their character, thinking that other things will keep them safe or gain them unstoppable, and the Necromancer is the squishiest, slowest class in the game unless you're a pure blood build, and even then it still suffers, so you absolutely need to have Blood Mist on your skill bar. I'm sorry, but it's just the way that the game's developed at this point. I'm also going to have the build guide for this at maxroll.gg linked down below so that you can follow along, use the interactive tools to be able to see everything a lot more easily, but I just want to quickly go over the skills and why we have them so that somebody who already has a good handling of the game can kind of just copy the build and try it out themselves. We only have one point into our generator and again we're using Acolyte's Reap to be able to get that corpse every five seconds. We do want to pick up Imperfectly Balanced, increasing our core skill cost, but also increasing our core skill damage. Only one point into Unliving Energy because having maximum essence is just kind of nice to have, but not really required for this build. Max points into Sever and then we're using the Vulnerability Secondary Modifier. Hued Flesh is is another auto include on every single necromancer build, lucky hit chance to be able to generate a corpse, and every single tick of our corpse explosion in sever is able to have a chance to generate a corpse, and that's how we basically have near continuous essence since we use corpse explosion as a mana battery. One point into blood mist, maxing out corpse explosion and using the blooded corpse explosion so it swaps over to a darkness skill doing shadow damage, three points into grim harvest as well as fueled by death, giving us additional damage when we consume a corpse, and generating a ton of essence which is so much better considering we don't really have a good essence generator in the form of reap. I'm actually putting the three points into skeletal mage mastery because it's nice to be able to keep them alive and they do a decent amount of damage although they're mostly here for utility's sake. You only need one point into corpse tendrils. You're able to get additional ranks of corpse tendrils on your boots which will help to reduce its cooldown. I see some people kind of maxing us out to have a lower cooldown but I think that the natural flow of the necromancer's clear speed means that you basically should have corpse tendrils up at the beginning of every single fight and if it's a longer fight you'll be able to use it again without needing to worry about putting more points in. And then we want to get over to play Corpse Tendrils to be able to get that vulnerable on application so that we have as many options available to us to be able to maximize our damage. For the Shadow Passives, 3 points into Reaper's Pursuit for the movement speed, 3 points into Gloom just to be able to stack additional shadow damage every time we deal shadow damage, and then 3 points into Terror so that while we have Corpse Tendrils up, we're getting a massive amount of additional multiplicative damage since they'll be slowed and stunned as well as having vulnerable on them. I only put one point into Crippling Darkness. This is nice to be able to apply stun more often. It's also nice because it helps to apply stagger to bosses at an incredibly fast rate. Putting more points into it would apply more stagger, but I don't really think that the increase in stun length is super important considering we have other places we'd rather put our points. I'm going to skip over the ultimate node for a quick second because the star of the show is absolutely this Shadow Blight passive and I just really wanted to talk about this for a second because it's a little bit difficult to understand it at face value. 
First off, dealing any form of shadow damage, either via you or your minions, will apply Shadow Blight. Shadow Blight is a debuff on the monster that lasts for two seconds. For those two seconds, you and your minions deal an additional 10% multiplicative damage just flat out. Then on top of that, every 10 times a monster would receive a form of shadow damage, regardless of how small it is, they just take 20% weapon damage as additional shadow damage. This isn't a multiplier of the damage dealt, this is a flat amount of additional shadow damage. So if we have those five corpse explosions going on a monster, that means that five ticks are happening twice a second, it means that within one second, they will take 10 instances of shadow damage and you will apply 20% additional shadow damage to them in the form of our current weapon damage would be 285. Now, while this damage doesn't seem super important or super high, it's because of how often this applies to targets. We have so many instances of shadow damage that this thing is actually proccing multiple times per second, depending on how many monsters are around, how many corpses have been generated, if all of our shadow mages are up, and if we're able to spam sever on top of the corpse explosions. But you could expect this to trigger at least once every two seconds, bare minimum, on the target. So every two seconds, you're just dealing 20% weapon damage for free. And that's before we get into just how busted the aspects are for this key passive. But let's talk about the last three points that I have on the character. Inspiring Leader really seems like it's a minion only passive because it's clearly in the minion passives section of the tree. But it says after you've been healthy for four seconds, you and your minions gain 12% attack speed. 12% attack speed is incredibly important. It increases the rate that we're able to drop Sever. It increases the rate that we're able to drop all of our corpse explosions as well as corpse tendrils. It's just incredibly powerful to have more attack speed on your character since it's effectively a total multiplier of all your damage since you're able to do all of your animations that much faster. But on top of that, it also increases the rate that our minions attack, meaning the faster they are applying their shadow damage, meaning the faster that they're able to help proc additional instances of shadow blight. For the Book of the Dead, very quickly, we are sacrificing the Bone Golem for even more increased attack speed. So if we're healthy at this point, we have 25% increased attack speed, which is pretty nice. You could also sacrifice the Iron Golem for increased critical strike damage, since Sever is a critical strike damage build on top of a shadow damage over time build. It kind of marries these two concepts together, but I think that ultimately the increased attack speed is going to be more valuable than the crit damage. For the Shadow Mage, we're using the secondary enhancement to be able to fire off an additional Shadow Bolt every five attacks, increasing the rate that we're able to proc Shadow Blight passive. And then for the Skirmishers, we're sacrificing Reapers to have increased Shadow Damage. Or if you're on Hardcore, you could always sacrifice the Defenders to gain additional non-physical damage reduction. Now we understand the skills and how we're using them, let's go ahead and look at all of the Codex of Power abilities that would be incredibly strong on this build so that you can get ahead very easily. So make sure to prioritize running the dungeons that these come from so you can get them as soon as possible. Starting right off the bat, we have Blighted. This is from Akan's Grasp in Hawazar. It's very easy to get to. There's actually a waypoint right close to it. And this thing says, after Shadow Blight has done its damage 10 times, so you've procced 100 instances of shadow damage against monsters in general, you are going to deal an additional 50% multiplicative damage for all of your damage sources for the next six seconds. Now it's hard to understate just how powerful 50% multiplicative damage is for all damage sources that you apply for the next six seconds. But just to help you kind of conceptualize this a little bit, this is the minimum roll and it's not showing as if it were on a two-handed weapon. Now, I actually have a ring with the maximum roll available on it, which is dealing an additional 120% multiplicative damage whenever you have the Shadow Blight passive buff up. And if we were to put this onto a two-handed weapon, this would gain us 240% multiplicative damage for all damage sources, regardless of what type of skill we use, for six seconds. So already there is one of the strongest multipliers that are available in the game, bar none. And the only thing that really outshines this is just how ridiculous the bone skills on the Necromancer get. The best part about it being a Codex of Power entry means that you are not going to lose out if you put this onto your two-handed weapon and then replace it later, or just leave it on an amulet to gain you 75% additional damage whenever it procs. Now you might be asking yourself, how often does it procs? If it only lasts for six seconds and I need to do 100 ticks, how often can I realistically have this up? 
and in all of my testing I would say it takes somewhere around six seconds as long as you're fighting a decent density of monster or a boss monster that's alive for that long to be able to proc a hundred times you drop five different instances of corpse explosion on the ground you're using sever in between those when you have enough essence and then your shadow mages are firing off all of the time Edge Master is always a good offensive ability, which just says when you're at max essence, you deal an additional 10% multiplicative damage, and then as you use more of your essence, the bonus gets lower and lower. It's not a high priority, but it's a free damage scaler in case you don't have anything else. Grasping Veins is by far the second best aspect to be able to put onto this build because it just says you gain critical strike chance after using Corpse Tendrils, and then on top of that, you gain additional critical strike damage. So this helps to stack crit onto our build when we're also trying to focus on shadow damage over time, and it helps to make Sever be able to put out more consistently high amounts of damage, especially when that vulnerable proc is up. Reanimation can help to be a nice little bump to increase your Shadow Mage's damage, although I wouldn't really prioritize this one on a gear piece over one of the more highly valued aspects. Wind Striker is probably the best movement speed skill since we're going to have a decent amount of crit on this Sever build. Just being able to gain a little bit of movement speed every time we're leaving a fight is pretty nice on top of the Reaper's Pursuit. Umbral is by far the best early game resource aspect. It says that you restore one resource for every crowd control effect that you apply to every enemy. And since Corpse Tendrils applies two separate crowd control effects and can hit multiple enemies simultaneously, it means that you are typically generating 10 to 40 resource, depending on how many monsters are within range, whenever you successfully hit with Corpse Tendrils or start off a fight with Corpse Tendrils. This also means that when we're stacking our Miasma Corpse Explosion, every time we hit the lucky hit of applying stun on monsters, that's also generating us a ton of resource and makes for a really, really good mana battery. The Protector is an easy way to stack on survivability onto the build. Whenever you hit an Elite, you gain Barrier. Barrier is just really good, and I actually continue to use this all the way up into World Tier 4 when I haven't found any better aspects to put on my gear slot. The Expectant is a really easy way to be able to generate additional damage on Sepper if you're sitting there using Reap. I either generating corpses or just swinging into a big group to be able to generate resource. Using your basic skill gets you core skill damage. Pretty simple math there. On top of that, initiating a fight with Reap just to be able to generate the corpse and corpse tendrils can also gain you a ton of damage reduction for a small amount of time so that you can reposition more easily or stay safe because you're right in the faces of enemies if you have the might aspect on your helmet, your pants, or your chest piece. And then this is a really interesting aspect once you've actually managed to stack on enough critical strike chance onto your build. This says that critical strikes from Sever actually have a chance to generate blight under the target. This Blight is also going to deal increased bonus damage over the base skill damage that it normally would. On top of that, this Blight is also going to apply any additional modifiers or abilities that you have that pertain to Blight. So if you were to put five ranks into Blight, take the enhancement and then take a modifier, you have a 10% chance when you crit on Sever to be able to cast a fully functional full skill Blight that'll add on additional shadow damage ticks per second for our Shadow Blight passive, and then apply things like Immobilize in Slow, which are all available on the Blight skill itself. Aspect of Retribution is kind of interesting because the first part really doesn't matter at all. Distant enemies have a chance to be stunned by you whenever they deal damage, that kind of doesn't matter. But what it also says is that you just deal 20% increased damage to any stunned monsters. So not only do all of our shadow damage have a lucky hit chance to be able to apply stun, but on top of that, Corpse Tendrils just straight up stuns monsters when they pulled in. So this does just say whenever you start a fight with Corpse Tendrils or you've managed to hit that lucky hit, you're doing 20% multiplicative damage. So this is a really, really nice scale that you could just toss onto a ring if you wanted to for added damage when you're already in the best circumstances for your build to be able to speed up fights. So you can see I went ahead and put Disobedience on my helmet for that additional armor whenever we deal damage. I put Protector onto my chest plate. We gain that barrier whenever we attack an elite. Onto our gloves, we put Grasping Veins to get that crit chance and additional crit damage whenever we use Corpse Tendrils. On our boots, we put Wind Striker, so we gain that additional movement speed whenever we crit. On the amulet, I have the Critical Strikes from Sever able to spawn a Blight because this will increase the base chance of it being able to proc, which is just nice on the amulet, and it'll also increase the bonus damage that the Blight will do. And then we have Umbral on our ring to be able to generate resource. For our weapon, we actually put on the basic skill increases our core skill. Since I'm starting off every single fight with a Reap Corpse Tendrils, the next Sever that comes out will just do bare minimum an additional 10% damage. And then because I already had this on the ring, I'm just going to go ahead and equip it, but I would have put this Shadow Blight Key Passive onto my two-hander if I didn't already have this example. 
So now that we have all of our aspects onto our gear, let's go ahead and continue to run this dungeon and see just how much more smoothly we're operating. So here we have a big pack, go ahead and drop the corpse tendrils, and then I start corpse exploding and dropping in severs, and they start dying a whole heck of a lot faster than they were previously. You can even just start the fight out right if you already have the vulnerability proc up with your sever, drop a couple corpse explosions, and then clean up with sever once you've generated enough resource. Starting off this fight with the corpse tendrils combo, dropping in a sever, dropping in a few corpse explosions just to get back our resource, generating more fortify by generating more corpses. Elite here, always want to start off with the corpse tendrils combo. In this one, I'm just spamming Sever while my minions are also attacking, and we're able to drop it without needing to generate any additional resource or dropping any of our corpse explosions. This is typically a close build, so you also want to prioritize getting close damage as often as you can, since we want to be as close as possible so that this travel distance on the Sever ability itself will get all four procs of additional damage. Whenever you have a slightly tankier mob, disengaging to drop all the corpse explosions and then coming back in with Sever once you have full essence is the way to keep this flow and have it be as efficient as possible. Resummon any skeletal mages if and when they die. You'll notice that we engaged multiple packs there and I only had one die and I actually never used the heal ability on them. Like I said, they're fairly tanky, they're pretty decent at actually staying out of the fight as often as they can because they're attacking from the back ranks there. And then after you get a decent amount of damage up and you have your corpse explosions going, you can kind of just sit there and the monsters will inevitably die. Using Sever to speed it up, obviously, because nobody likes to stand there doing nothing while fighting, but it is pretty impressive just how much damage the corpse explosion part of the engine can do by itself. And again, you want to be as close as possible so that whenever you actually do proc multiple Sever hits, you're getting all four instances of damage on the target. There you go. So that's how the build now functions with the aspects on it, as you would expect. You get better resource management, better survivability. We basically had barrier up the entirety of the time and getting that really nice damage increase from the Shadow Blight passive roughly half of the time that we're fighting. Now, what I also wanted to show you is what the character looks like at a slightly higher level with better gear. So this is a level 60 Necromancer. I'm in World Tier 3. I've actually already cleared into World Tier 4 on my Bone Spear Necromancer. And as you'll see, I'm actually fully kitted out for Bone Spear. This is my Bone Spear weapon. This is my ossified essence amulet for that passive. This is my bone storm helmet and I'm using my bone spear attack speed etc gloves. So the gear that I'm wearing is all kitted out for my bone spear necromancer but what I've done is I've swapped over all my skills to be the same as I just showed you on the other character. I've swapped over my book of the dead to be the same and literally all I've done is thrown on that shadow blight passive ring to be able to get that benefit. Just to kind of highlight on a much higher difficulty yes with better gear but with with gear that's completely not meant for this character, what the build can do. So we engage in the fight in the typical way that we normally would, reap into corpse tendrils, and I haven't even cast the corpse, oh no. All right, well everything died a little bit too fast there, so hopefully it won't die nearly as fast here. We have a lot of tanky monsters. I wanna get them a little bit closer just so we can get the big wombo combo on them. There we go, into corpse tendrils. Immediately start spamming sever and corpse explosion. The elite dies. All the monsters die, lickety split. Resummon our skeletons. We keep it moving. Bam, reap. Corpse tendrils dropping in severs as it's already coming down. Corpse explosion to get it up. We're currently at six stacks for our corpse blight passive. The issue here being that the monsters are just dying too fast for me to actually get enough ticks to be able to get the bonus up. That's why it's actually really, really good on boss mobs because they are alive long enough for you to get all of your stacks on it so you can have that more continuous bonus from the aspect itself. Here we have a big juicy pack. Everybody get on in here and then finish it off with sever and that's basically the exact clean type of execution that you're looking for. Huge density in monsters, dropping the corpse tendrils, getting them all onto it, already having the corpse explosions there so when they drop in they start taking damage immediately, and then dropping in the sever as you go. If you're ever in a scary situation like I just was, you could always blood mist obviously at instant speed to be able to get out of that. Since it is an unstoppable skill, it'll immediately go into effect. You can see like just how smooth this becomes, right? Even this where you had the 
damage resistance monster up. I didn't even manage to kill it initially. I just pulled everything else with their damage resistance buff up and everything's dying. Now let's go ahead and talk about early game Paragon because my character is only level 60. I only have so many actual Paragon points to be able to highlight here, but I wanted to kind of show you what I think would be a really good option for you to build into because it's not as obvious as you may assume. So the typical darkness board would be the wither board here. It says that your damage over time effects have a 5% chance to deal an additional 50% bonus damage each time they deal damage. So basically one in 20 ticks will do an additional 50% multiplier. That chance is increased 1% and the bonus damage is increased by 2.5% for each 50 willpower that you have. So right now on my character, I have 144 willpower. So if I have 144 willpower, let's just say that's 150 willpower just for ease of calculation. It increases that chance up to 8%. And now all of a sudden closer to one in 10 ticks are doing an additional 50% damage, which is definitely very, very good. But you'll notice I'm already a level 60 character. I have really decent ancestral and sacred gear on. I have a decent amount of additional stats. Building into this board right away might not get you that big additional damage boost that you're looking for. Sure, it'll happen some of the time, but we're only talking about the damage over time effects, whereas Sever has instantaneous damage effects. So half of the damage that you're able to pump out, especially against single targets, where the Necromancer typically struggles the most, is not a damage over time ability. Now that being said, the majority of rare nodes on this board are all very powerful. So we have increased to shadow damage with intelligence here. We have additional shadow damage over time and additional shadow damage, which are two different types of shadow damage multipliers. Damage to affected by shadow damage over time enemies, as well as damage to elites, and then damage reduction from enemies that are affected by damage over time. So this is definitely a board that I would recommend building into, but I don't think it should be your first board that you build into. Basically the first board that I'm building into on every single Necromancer right now is the Flesh Eater board. Flesh Eater board pound for pound has some of the best efficiency in glyph sockets, efficiency in rare nodes and legendary nodes, and some of the best multipliers that are available. If you're using the Corpse Explosion engine to be able to generate your essence, this says every time that you consume five corpses, which is every single fight, for six seconds you have a 40% damage multiplier. That applies to your Corpse Explosion damage, that applies to your Sever damage, that even goes forward to buff up your minions damage. It is just a huge multiplier for all of your damage types for doing the thing that the build does best, which is cast Corpse Explosion as much as possible and generate resource for Sever. On top of that, the rare nodes around it are incredibly powerful. This one dealing damage to injured enemies, meaning that once a monster is below 35% of their maximum life, they'll begin to take additional damage. So at the end of a fight where you're typically out of resource, you ran out of corpses, you're trying to finish off a fight against a really strong monster, all of a sudden your damage spikes again. Not only that, it also increases critical strike damage, which Sever is a pseudo critical strike build, so this is definitely going to help you out as well. Another huge note on this board is just straight up damage to elites. So an elite is a boss, unique, elite monster, even in PvP players are considered elites. So straight up damage increase to elites is absolutely what most people are looking to prioritize because killing trash minions is easy enough, but dealing damage to heavier, tankier monsters is the real true test of whether or not a build is going to be effective. You also have resistance to all elements, which is really good survival stat. So in addition to that, in the magic nodes, you can pick up even more damage to elites. So right here, you can get 24 damage to elites and 16 damage to elites, a total of 40% additive damage to elite monsters. The other important thing to note is that we have a rare node that has attack speed on it. Now, the lucky hit chance to execute non-elites, that's nothing, that's garbage. That's absolutely useless stats. But 5% attack speed here, along with two additional magic nodes of 2.5% attack speed, means that you can pick up another 10% attack speed on your build, which again, remember, that increases all of your animation speed. It is just a total end multiplier of all your potential damage output, because doing animations faster means the damage comes out faster. Now, on top of that, this glyph socket is a really good dexterity glyph socket for a four node radius glyph. So once you have a glyph, so once you have a glyph up to tier 15, you're able to hit the minimum requirements for dexterity and then upwards of 44 total dexterity for a really good bonus. I personally am actually building up towards the Gravekeeper Glyph and this is for multiple builds and I'll explain why. The additional requirement, which is what you would need to have enough dexterity to be able to reach, says that you deal an additional 2% increased damage up to 12% for each corpse that you're near. 
most builds use the lucky hit chance to be able to proc corpses. You're surrounded by corpses all the time. So it effectively says once a fight is started, you just have 12% additional multiplicative damage, but it's the bonus to rare nodes that I think is a super slept on stat here. By putting this glyph socket within radius of my rare nodes here, right now at level six, I am doubling their effectiveness. So this rare node will now give me 32% damage to elites and 20 intelligence, and this node will give me 8% to all resistances and 20 intelligence. And then by the time I get up to this glyph, if I already have the dexterity required to be able to hit it, that's an additional 16% damage to elites, which will be doubled by the glyph. So all of a sudden, this single node now says 64% additive damage versus elites. And the more that I level up this glyph, the higher that bonus to the rare nodes becomes. And while it's weird to do this part last, I realize not everybody is going to have built out their starter board at this point, so I should cover it. I go off to the right side to be able to pick up the additional damage and maximum life. I want to be able to hit that willpower requirement as soon as possible to get the additional damage bonus from it. And then I also pick up the two additional damage magic nodes within radius in a single additional life node. In my base board, I've put the exploit glyph because I'm able to apply vulnerable so often. This would happen both on my bone spear build, which is how I have this built out, and also on this sever build since both corpse tendrils and severer are able to apply vulnerable. This is going to give me additional vulnerable damage, as well as increasing how much damage I do to vulnerable targets every time I deal damage to vulnerable targets. To be able to hit the dexterity requirement, I do need to pick up this magic node here, and then I actually build over to left to knowledge for even more damage and even more intelligence. And then I go straight to the gate before building into Flesh Eater. And there you have it. That is the Sever version of the Darkness Necromancer build. I hope that you enjoyed this build. If you have any questions, please feel free to comment down below or check out the Discord link and come hang out in the D4 section that I have within the Discord. A ton of people have been joining recently, all theory crafting together, all asking questions, trying to help share the knowledge. So if you're one of those types of people who likes to participate in those types of communities, come along in. We'd love to have you. Again, thank you so much for watching this video. I hope that you enjoyed it and I look forward to seeing you in the next one.